Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, um, depending on what part of the world you are in right now. Um, my name is Omo Omi Charles, and I'll be your MC for today. Welcome to another edition of Wife's Gist. Um, we've been having a series of these gists, and they've always been awesome. Um, today, we'll be talking about roller coaster emotions. How do we handle our emotions as ladies? We know that we are more emotional beings than our male counterparts. Um, and we need to learn to manage those emotions um, for us to, you know, enjoy our, our marriages, enjoy being mothers, and even our, our relationship with people all around us. Um, with us today, we have Mami and, um, and Mrs. Koko Ola um, to, you know, share some experiences and also to, you know, give us some more professional advice on how we manage our roller coaster emotions. But before we start, um, well, we, we typically will start with a, an icebreaker. Um, today, um, the first thing I'll do or I'll ask of everyone is to please um, send an emoticon or a smiley, as some people we call it, um, that expresses how you feel right now. Um, I'm looking forward to your responses. Um, for me, I'm a bit shaky. <laughs> I had a very interesting afternoon, um, short of breaking my husband's head, but um, uh, I'm trying to put it all together here. So please share how you feel. Please, you can use the chat um, session, use the chat section to put in your, oh yeah, I can see some people smile, some, ha some are smiling, happy. That's fantastic. Mm, Kaya is so so. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you for your responses. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I believe most of the responses will come in from YouTube. I think we have more people on YouTube. Um, I'll continue. I have another, shall I call it icebreaker, and it's about roller coasters. I know we're talking about roller coaster emotions, and I just thought to ask, you know, everyone. Um, we have different kinds of people or different types of roller coaster riders. Um, please feel free to tell us which one you are. Are you the screamer? Are you the veteran? Are you the talker or the OMGer? Or are you the bench warmer? Which one are you? Are you the screamer or the veteran? Or are you the one who, who despite um, being um, in a height, on a height of about 215 foot, will still be gisting on the, on the roller scream? Mommy says she's a, she's a screamer. Um, I, or more me, Charles, I'm none of the above because you'll never catch me near one. I, I, I don't know. I've ne the day I would climb a roller coaster, that day, I think uh, uh, it would be a major like milestone for me. Um, okay. Let's see some more comments here. Major Screamer. <laughs> Thank you for that response. Re major Screamer. I'm nowhere near the veteran. I don't know how people do that thing. Um, I'm not the screamer either. You will not even just catch me there. Um, I don't know how people will talk and talk. Oh, calm and laughing. So you are definitely the veteran, Pikayo. Wow. You're definitely the veteran. That's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your responses. I believe we'll go straight in. Um, to our first speaker. Uh, Mami is going to be sharing um, her experience around how she's been able to manage, you know, how she's been able to grow, you know, in this whole emotions thing. It's, I believe it's in stages. And when we, as, ki as kids, I'm sure those of us that have children will, will realize that um, our kids, 
um, emotions mature as they grow, but in different ways. And it depends on how much you, we've been able to teach them to self-regulate and stuff like that. Um, so mom is going to be showing, share with us her personal experience and growth in relation to coaster, roller coaster emotions. Um, mommy, um, over to you, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank um, you for joining right. us. Thank, thank you, too. Yeah. I cannot actually start my video because apparently um, the host has stopped it. So, okay. Uh, okay, I can now do that. Great. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here. And um, good evening to everyone. I don't know, okay, maybe other parts, people will be maybe the afternoon or the morning, but it's evening uh, here in Ghana. And um, just coming on to share my own experience with, you know, roller coaster emotions and stuff. I'll just dive right in. Um, she asked, like, you know, what is maybe everyone's typical reaction to being on a roller coaster? And I want to actually write that or say that I am not just the screamer, but I'm also the OMG, I'm the talker, because I do all of, of the above, you know, I'm running my mouth. So I'm doing all of, you know, reacting to everything that is happening. And I realized that also comes from the fact that even as a person, um, I realized that I was very impulsive. Now, people m miss the fact that, um, even as people, we are a makeup of so many things and not just, just our experiences, but even our parents. So I noticed that even my mom had impulsive tendencies. So what happened was that growing up, I know that she would re react, she was more reactive than, our, than reflective. So what would happen was that we didn't like that. And I didn't like the experience of that growing up. And it was interesting because it was only when I hit my early 20s and I realized that I was doing certain things in reaction to people. And the very thing I didn't like that my mom did, I was doing the same thing with other people, my friends or in the context of relationship. So I noticed that, and when you're impulsive, you read, even if this, I don't know if everybody on the platform is, you know, religious or, you know, Christian or something, but if you read even the Bible talks about how Peter was, you know, Peter was quite impulsive. Mm -hmm. So people who are impulsive, they respond constantly to external circumstances. So what's happening on the outside. So um, we are more of the reactive people. So then the smallest things trigger you. So even if somebody is even saying something nice is happening to you, but someone comes and says one thing to you, you quickly respond to that. Then you go back into another emotion. So you always, you're always never stable. And I remember that um, the one thing that happened when he met Jesus was that he said that now you said you become like on this rock, I'll build my church that uh, about Peter finding some sense of stability. So I realized that my impulsiveness as a person would always, um, I would never have peace of mind. So I was always fluctuating between feelings and I would always blame something for how I felt. So I would say, oh, well, the season I'm in um, is justification enough for me to feel this way or because my siblings um, are very annoying, it only makes sense that I'll react this way or where I'm working, my boss is unreasonable, so I'm justified to be moody or um, to be angry. And so you always have a reason and a justification, a true one for that matter, to feel the way you're feeling. But what I learned um, on my journey of growth was that, and I'm still on that journey, is that um, the thing is you can never control what's happening outside you. You have zero control over your circumstances because sometimes you cannot tell how your day will go who is going to annoy you, what they are going to say. And the only person you have control over is yourself. So I said to myself that I can't keep feeling unstable because then you don't have peace of mind, right? Because then it's like, even if you know God, you can actually have a bad, like something always happens and you have to go back and say, God, take this feeling away from me. And they are constantly going back to pray for the same thing. God, deliver me from a sharp mouth. Oh, um, God, help me not to respond this way or... So really like if I don't know with every woman, but even if you're in a in a emotional relationship, you send some long text, um, venting, maybe you realize to your partner about one small thing, the next minute you regret everything you said. Maybe if you waited a moment and reacted differently, it could have been different. Or sometimes even if you're very reactive um, with your emotions, you always don't make the right call. So one thing that I learned was that I can never control what's happening on the outside. 
So what I would now do is that I'll catch myself in the moment when that overwhelming feeling comes to say something or to do something. So someone would do something and the overwhelming, there's a feeling that comes, it feels so strong and it makes you feel like you are justified in that moment to react. So when it comes, it's, so, it's overpowering to an extent because all your senses tell you in that moment that this reaction is okay or it's okay, like even to feel sad. It's a very overpowering or overwhelming feeling. When that feeling comes, that feeling is usually deceptive because then it is all your body, your senses are at work. Your mind is not being able, it's not working at that moment. Logic is not working. It's only emotions and emotions are fickle. They're like current, right? They keep changing. So one thing that I learned was that in that moment where the feeling was overpowering, I'll not do anything. I'll have to stop myself. Now that requires extra work. I know that like sometimes when people are very spiritual, they'll say, oh God, change me. And they forget the fact that even you have to play a role in that. You have to make a decision and ask for his help. Sometimes we think that God will come and even choose for us to do differently. So typical example, um, if let's say for me, like I remember um, this relationship I was in and I would always, if the person says something and I wasn't sure, I started getting scared. I had this overwhelming feeling and I want to send some text and say something because I was like, no, what they said was wrong. And every time I did that, I would always regret the next moment. Like, ah, oh, why did I say all these things? And I kept repeating the same thing. I'll say, oh God, deliver me from this thing. Change my mind, change it. And you keep praying the same prayer until the day I realized that even you play a role in the transformation in your life, you have to choose that you don't like the outcomes. You don't like the fact that other things get to control you as a person. So then whenever those overwhelming feelings come, and not that I have arrived, because I'm also talking to myself, but now I've learned the thing of waiting. Don't send that message. Don't say that thing. If they even someone gives the advice that even if in that moment you want to react to something, I'm talking more about reactive because that's my personal experience because of the impulsive thing I'm talking about. Even if you're upset, in that moment that you're feeling that thing, give yourself a few minutes. Sometimes people say, even go to sleep. And if you wake up and you still feel like you want to say what you wanted to say, you may even be saying it a little differently. It may not change. Or maybe that feeling will be gone. But because of the lack of patience sometimes and the thing of, say, women are you know, overly emotional, we want to act. And that's when you are reactive. But when you are reflective, you give yourself a moment to process or to hold yourself. That is when you are taking power back from external things, from controlling you. Any woman who can be like that can go find life. A lot of times they'll say, oh, don't give women these roles because if you give a woman a role like this, she'll be, you no, know, they are very emotional. They cry over everything. They overreact. And it's true. I mean, our bodies go through changes. We go through um, our menstrual cycle. We ovulate. We have so many emotions we deal with already. It's hard. And that is the area where we need to master because usually the areas where you experience most weakness is actually potential for growth. Those are the areas where you have, those are the areas that when once you conquer, you can actually go further, you know, in life. But all women cannot conquer because we normalize it. And we normalize emotions. But emotions are never stable and they are hardly ever accurate because they are based on perception. But always, and the second thing I've learned beyond the catching myself is ask yourself the emotion that you are feeling, is it coming from a place of fear or love? Now fear will be like, okay, if I don't, react this way or maybe you start feeling sad because you start thinking mm, you know this does this mean that this will happen you know it's always ask yourself like what i'm feeling is it being motivated by fear or is being motivated by love because love is patient and it is kind it's compassionate it's long suffering it has self-control fear on the other hand fear has none of the above fear is all about right now and what you're feeling so when fear comes, is that crippling thing that makes you feel insecure, unsure. And usually it is not from a good place. So I have learned that to ask myself that in what I'm feeling now, whether it's sadness, whether it's anger, is it from fear, fear of being disrespected, fear of feeling like I'll be, I'm taking for granted, fear of if I don't do this, what can happen tomorrow? If it's motivated by fear, then you need to check it. So two major things that I have learned 
from dealing with my emotions is number one, having to be more reflective than reactive. That means taking a moment to process instead of acting. And number two, what I'm feeling is if I'm fear or love. And the Bible does say that God has given us, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, boldness, and a sound mind. And so anything that comes to trouble your mind and then make you think so much will feel like it's truth, but usually it's problematic. It's a lie. Anything that is right or true comes with peace. So these are the two things that I have been um, doing or following. I don't know if I've gone over my time. I should have looked at the time when I, when I started. I don't have 20 minutes. You're right. You're still within your time. Oh, okay. I'm, time. I'm on time. How many minutes do I have left, please? Um, you have uh, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I think that those are the two key things that I have been using um, to really like maybe a check or check myself. Okay. And um, the third thing I would just say, because I have 10 minutes left, is to know that um, there's a, just a quick story from the Bible about um, Hannah and Penina. And I don't, know, I don't know if everybody knows the story, but you know, Hannah didn't have a child and uh, Penina had a child. And when I was coming to this platform, I was just thinking, you know, it's a platform for wives. Now, I know typically and the general definition of a wife is a woman who has a husband. Now, that's a general statement. But when you look deeper into even the biblical definition, it says that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Now, it didn't say when he finds a woman. And so the thing was that it, the wife didn't come as a result of entering into a union. You know, I'm playing with semantics here. But it came because of, it's a character trait of a person, a woman who has learned, like the 31, Proverbs 31 woman, a woman who um, walks in the world of God, a woman who has even uh, learned herself, who is self-aware. Self-awareness comes to do with processing your weaknesses, knowing where your strengths are. So why am I bring the Hannah and Penina story? Because Hannah didn't have a child. And Penina had kids and she was always feeling taunted. And we live in an era of social media. And you can imagine a lot of people are feeling very dissatisfied with their lives because of social media. Maybe they'll see somebody how great, or not even social media per se, but you see another person, how great they are with their kids or um, how things are going so well for their family or going so well for the person. Especially with women, we struggle with that a lot with comparison, if you're going to be honest. And Hannah's dissatisfaction, I mean, no matter how much the man loved her, she didn't feel like she was enough. She didn't have a kid. And what worried her so much was never the fact that, not the kid per se, Yes, it's true not having a child was a bother, but the fact that the other woman was taunting her with that. And what I realized was that she was going through all the emotional turmoil of living with somebody who would rub your weakness in your face. And we live in a world where constantly we all have everybody on this who may be listening to me and will have one thing or the other that they are looking for. They want to become better. And you may see somebody else doing better in that space or having what you would one day pray to have, right? And those things can affect our emotions a lot. And it's made it worse because of social media. And so what happened with Hannah was what? She constantly did feel dissatisfied, even though she had a man who loved her, right? It was not enough. But because that would never, ever be enough. But what happened was that when she made a prayer, what happened was that she tapped into something bigger than herself. She made a selfless prayer of asking God to give her a child, not for her to feel satisfied, to taunt the other person who had been making fun of her or prove a point, but because she saw there was a need in the community at the time for men who serve God. And that's what happens when a woman, when you become stable or find some sense of stability in life, is that when you attach your life to a mission bigger than yourself, she saw something that God needed, not the other woman, you know, her husband needed, but some that God, because her husband already had kids with the other woman, right? But she saw that there was a need in the community, in the society, and she found a purpose bigger than herself. And she said, God, if you would, I would partner with you to do this thing, you know, to bring life and give this life back to you. And what am I trying to leave with us today that in the roller coaster emotion thing, we can't fight it because we can't get rid of, rid of it completely because we're human. We will overcome it in stages as we keep growing. But fundamentally, as a woman to find stability, attach your life to a purpose bigger than yourself, to a mission 
that finds where you find a need in the society in your community there's something that you know that is bigger than you that even your essence or your your life on earth is serving a purpose outside a man outside yes kids and all of those that are great but you are doing something unique in partnership with god something bigger than you that you know that is filling a void in the society israel didn't have a prophet at the time and hannah's turmoil her imbalance her you know her weakness her all the things that she was feeling about herself she found answer and solution when she found a need in the community to serve and when we stop looking so much inwardly at ourselves and how we are feeling to bigger things in, around us whether it's um human rights or people what is happening like poverty and we attach our lives to purpose that is bigger than us we now find some sense of stability because as a human being you are you have god in you and um petty things like who annoyed you and those things yeah i mean they happen all the time but there are bigger things out there people who are hungry a world that is dying and i think that when we are now focused on big things sometimes the petty things don't worry you so much because you attach yourself to something big and so today i want to leave with you that you know in more like cosa emotions they do happen but you find stability number one be more reflective than you know um impulsive or reactive and number two asking yourself this way i'm feeling is it motivated by fear or love and number three attaching your life to a mission to a purpose on earth bigger than yourself where you know that this i can't do myself i can do with god and you know that this thing will change people's lives because you find joy you do find peace when you are making a difference whether it's in your community even in your family and or your nation or wherever you find yourself but something that is much bigger than you so that's what i'll leave with you thank you thank you so much yes um thank you so much um for well, that very i like the way you put everything all together um and the things i've actually picked uh, you know for myself and and i've actually maybe i haven't been able to articulate it that way for myself is i've also learned to be more um reflective than reactive especially in the face of um work in my career you know sometimes right. you someone sends an email and you know immediately you just you know you just get so upset and you're like oh, no, i need to give this person a piece of my mind like I <laughs> someone said if you want to give people a piece of your your mind what would you, would you have left at the end of the day if you are always giving people <laughs> a piece of your mind and you know i i learned that um don't just be quick to send that email don't be too quick to um pick up the phone and just call and just give them a piece of your mind most times when you sit back and you reflect you find out that what you were reading is not even actually what was meant or intended <laughs> because right. like, so you will have ended up being a fool right. at the end of the day and yeah. i caught myself you know in um, you know in like two or three situations like that and i learned and i said <laughs> i don't want to be the fool i want i always want of course i always want to be seen as a smart one so i learned to be more reflective than reactive um another thing you said is about being self aware right um self awareness is is it's is what has brought you to where you are many people right. are not self aware if you get to that point of being self aware then you know that you have emotional problems or issues that you actually need to deal with right and the, and the, the biggest of it for me is when you said in in order for you to get some form of stability you have to attach your life to something bigger than you in partnership right. with god right that is really key if you have a bigger assignment you have things that you are after not necessarily what must go on social media or whatever but right. if you have a bigger purpose you would not even have time to um care about those petty things that actually disturb us as as women thank right. you so much you know i really i really really enjoy this short but i like the way you put it all together three points be more reflective than reactive um mm -hmm. ask yourself am i is this emotion coming from a place of fear or a place of love mm -hmm. um and thirdly attach your life to something much more important attach your life to attach your life to purpose that way you get more stability in terms of your emotions thank you very much mommy thank um, you too.
Thank you. We're going to still have like a Q&A session at the end. At okay. the end. Um, but right now, I'm going to call on our next speaker. Um, but before I call her, I will introduce her briefly. Um, Olayemi Ayeni Popola is a certified cognitive behavior therapist, uh, practitioner, and uh, she's a certified counseling practitioner. She's a member Academy of Modern Applied Psychology. Um, before opening the True North practice, she had worked more than 30 years in various um, you know, industries, um, helping functions in both the financial and hospitality industries as a teacher, counselor, um, workplace and manpower planner and strategist. Um, she was also a change manager and facilitator for both individual and corporate organizations. Um, in addition to all of these, she's a professional chef and a chartered accountant. What an interesting combination. Wow. And she has been a Christian since her teen years and firmly believes in the institutes of marriage and the family system. Um, she's, a, she's in a blended family, um, blended, sorry, she's in a blended family and she's happily married with one daughter and three stepchildren. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Olayemi Ayeni Fukuola um, to talk us through how to manage this roller coaster emotion of the day. You're everybody. welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm glad to be here. Um, wow, Mami, I've, um, I've learned a few things from you in terms of new ways of looking at some things in the bible and new scripture the hannah and penina story i'd never seen it in that light before but um i'm glad that you shared it thank you very much so um we're talking about roller coaster emotions and generally when people say i'm emotional my emotions are all over the place there is an identifying tag people seem to feel that emotions are a bad thing but emotions are a part of us for a reason. We, as human beings, we need emotions to motivate us to do things, to one of certain things. For instance, fear is a natural emotion that gives us, tells us whether we need to flee. It's a survival instinct that comes in to say whether we need to flee or not to flee. If we're um, angry, it releases, it's because it releases certain um, certain um, hormones in us that makes us act in a particular way, also to help with our survival and all that. If we are happy, we leave endorphins into our system. It gives us energy. You know, so there are different reasons why we feel all the emotions that we feel. So the problem is not really being emotional. The problem is being led by the emotions that we feel. Um, every, every human has the capacity to be emotional. Certain temperaments, certain personalities show, tend to show more emotion, in a, tend to show more of a particular kind of emotion. For instance, if you're an introvert and you're more inward thinking, you're more likely to, uh, to be prone to anxiety. Anxiety in itself is not a bad thing because it helps you to focus on something that you need to focus on. It is when that focus now goes out of proportion and it makes you feel that you need to, um, you can't see beyond what it is that you're focusing on, so that it paralyzes you, then the anxiety becomes a problem. But in itself, anxiety is not a bad thing. So if you're phlegmatic, you're um, melancholy, you're likely to be more prone to things like anxiety. If you're a hyper person, if you're choleric, you're bossy, you're domineering, you're most likely quick to fit into anger. That's, that would be probably your most dominant emotion that you feel the most. That's what the emotion that you probably connect to with the most. Anger helps you, spurs you forward. It motivates you to do things the way that you need to do it. However, not being able to control it means that you may become quick-tempered. You, you, you focus on the task and you're so angry with people around you and you begin to influence, influence them, other people. Ne possibly negatively. Sometimes people get so annoyed as mothers and as wives, we get so annoyed that our children cannot even move, move from the spots where they are, where they are because mommy is on the warpath and nothing is going the way she wants to go and all that. And um, 
sometimes if you're like me, you're sanguine, you're very, you're not the angry, extroverted kind of person. You're more of the happy-go-lucky kind of person. It means you're even more prone to mood swings because everybody's moods affect you, just like you're being melancholy and all that. Emotions are not bad. Where we have a problem with that emotions is when it begins to control our lives and when it begins to impact the relationship that we have with other people. And um, if you're in this seminar, I'm guessing that at some point or the other, you've had an emotion that has gone out of control, has impacted a situation negatively, has, you must have experienced it once, you said something you shouldn't have said. As uh, Mami said, you sent that long text that you'd never, ever, ever have seen the light of day, and you're thinking, oh goodness, you can't believe in this day and age, there's no way to record a text once it's gone from you. So there are different ways that we feel our emotions. There are different ways in which we, um, in which we express them. The challenge is having emotions that go up and down that are affected by different things. So before we, I focus on the emotions, I just want to explain to you how we think as human beings. As humans, we have three, that we have three state, we have three kinds of minds. We have the rational mind. Everybody has those three states in them. We have the rational mind that deals with facts. So with those facts, you're able to do academic stuff. You're able to learn stuff. You're able to analyze stuff. So at work, for instance, you find that some people can work so fantastically with figures. They can deal with figures and what's called because they operate out of a rational mind. And then when they go out of work and they're dealing with people, sometimes they deal also with those facts in such a way that they come across as cold and impersonal. So that's a kind of mind. Some other people operate on the other extreme. They base, their entire mind is based on feeling, on their belief, on their opinion. Rational mind is based on facts. Um, emotional mind is based on their belief, their opinion, their interpretation of how something has happened. The difference between the two is, for instance, I say, um, is a fact that, um, what's a fact? It's a fact that I'm a wife and I'm angry that I got myself in this situation. I'm angry that I'm a wife, why? Maybe because I'm not thinking in my emotional mind, I'm thinking all men are just the same. I should never have gone this. That is not a fact, but that is what is driving my emotional mind. But when I was making, so some people get married and they're freely there and they say, oh, you have to, love is not involved. You have to be very factual about it. Can he do this? Can he do this? Can he do that, that? And they're very rational in everything. And that's fantastic, but it doesn't do well for, for meaningful relationships. Because what it means is that you tend to, because you're dealing with facts and information, you tend to be more argumentative even when you're having discussions with people because you're dealing from a position of, I know, of, from a position of knowledge. So what you're conversing about is about how knowledgeable or how true to knowledge your information is. If you're emotional, you're dealing with your, how you feel in the moment. As Mami said, you're constantly reactive. You're reactive in that you're happy. You're reactive in that you're angry. You're reactive in that people around you are sad, so you're sad. You're reactive in that people around you are crying, so you're crying. You know, and it has its place in every life. But it cannot be that is how you constantly make all your decisions. Because you would agree with me that when you start behaving in a way that is determined by what, what your belief is or your interpretation of a particular event at this moment, then you begin to come across as irrational, irresponsible, not, you're not, um, you not dependable, and therefore people do not trust you. But there's a third mind that every human being also has the capacity to develop, and that's the rational mind. A rational mind is what, is, it takes facts and information, it takes emotions, it's cognizant of emotions, but it controls it with the rational, with, um, with the rational mind, and being emotionally intelligent about things that are going on around you. When you operate from your emotional mind, as Mami had implied, you're more introspective and everything is about how you have reacted, how you have interpreted, and it's a very selfish way of living life. And I don't know if anybody has a friend that is, out, that is obviously selfish in terms of how they behave. I'm sure you know that that means you can't trust them to make certain decisions that will be in the best interest of you as their friend or you as their husband or you as the child or you as the daughter. When people perceive you as always thinking about yourself or always reacting 
because of how this makes you feel, then you become less trustworthy. And this is why we must make every effort to, to get off that roller coaster and begin to operate in a more stable mind environment. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that, um, I just want to quote it directly. Very, it's in Proverbs 20, 8, 28. It says, he that has no rule, he that doesn't have a control over his spirit is like a city without walls. And that honestly is what happens. It means that you become the dumping ground for the consequence of everybody's behavior. So um, your child makes a plate, um, you get angry, and then you're okay after five minutes, you calm down. And then the next 10 minutes, something else happens. Um, your husband comes late or didn't buy what, or didn't do what you, he was supposed to do. You get angry again, then you calm down. Then, so you're just a dumping ground reacting to everything around you. It's like you don't have a window. You don't have boundaries. You don't have anything. You're just constantly being bombarded by different things. Anything that comes your way enters into your house, enters into your circle, enters into your thoughts and enters into the way that you behave. Once again, I say to you that if you were to go, if you are walking on a dark road, you don't know what's going on, and um, you come to this uncompleted building, you see this building that is not quite complete, and somebody says, oh, come into this building with me, you, somebody you don't know, or whatever it is, I'm sure you will think twice that, about coming into the building because you're thinking, you don't know what is lurking. I don't know how many of you watch those movies where you're screaming, don't go in, don't open the door, don't go in. Can't you see that there's no windows? Anything could be lurking in the dark. And you're screaming when you're watching TV. And somehow that's how we are as when we're working in our emotions, when we're living in our emotions. Nobody, people are afraid to come into you because they don't know what to expect. There's no boundary. You have no filter. You have nothing. Your only filter is how you feel at the moment. As mothers and as husbands, I do not know how that will serve you in those two roles. As a person, as an individual, I don't know how it's going to serve you as a person when you, you, when you, you, it's tiring. So somebody, I think um, somebody had said, you know, when we're talking about the um, roller coaster ride, and she said, oh, somebody said, I live for it, I smile through it, and everything. For, if you, for someone like me, I don't do roller, I mean, I've done it in the past, I don't think I can do it again. But you know, when you go on a roller coaster journey, you do it the first time, it's exciting. You do it the second time, you do it the third time. After a while, your body feels sick. Your body reacts to it. You know, I've been on roller coasters where by the time you're landing, people are throwing up because their body is just not used to that kind of treatment. And of course, some, people, some kids, I've been on a roller coaster before that there was a kid threw up and wanted to go back and join the line again. But I can assure you that by the time, there's a time that the novelty wears off. So maybe as a single person before you got married, you were really a roller coaster person. You, you enjoy the drama of your emotions being all over the place. So your fiance then also like the drama. But after a while, it begins to wear thin on people around you. Everybody's just used to the fact that, you know, once you have a serious discussion, so let's cut this person out because we don't want your drama. If you're that kind of person, then you need to begin to think, is this my behavior, my inability to control my emotions? Is it really serving me? What mommy did for herself is very, very fantastic. You need to become self-aware. You need to know, first of all, that you have roller coaster emotions, that you're being led by your emotions and that they're not serving you. If you're a talk show host, maybe emotions pushing people's buttons, it serves you. But if you're not, and you're living in the real life, it doesn't serve you in any way for people to not to be able to get a handle of you. Your husband doesn't know if, if I tell you this, if I say this today because you're in a good mood, you accept it and it's fine. Then tomorrow, if he says exactly the same thing because somebody has, had annoyed you five minutes time, it's suddenly, there's suddenly war because, and he's confused, he's thinking, because we did this yesterday and we all, we, a lot of us do it as parents. We discipline a child today because of the way we feel. Tomorrow for the same thing, we don't discipline the child because of the way we feel. We snap at a child today because of the way we feel. Tomorrow we don't do the same. And we just keep, and it's, it's, it makes you one untrustworthy. But the worst part is that it makes you easy to manipulate. 
that's another thing so apart from the fact that you're tiring to people around you it makes it easy for you to be manipulated because people can people know that if i don't know if you guys used to do it my mom too used to be just like mommy's mom she could be she for a long time she used to operate out of the emotional mind so it was easy to manipulate her get her to be upset about something so that when you now really because you know that there's another offense that you have committed so that by the time she has read that she's already tired of that offense so you you know she was just easier to manipulate and like my father who was a very he was a wise person so you couldn't manipulate him he's like okay you did that that's fine so this is the this is what's going to happen and then you say another thing and he sees this as two separate diff totally different things and he can relate to you because his emotions are not all over the place he's fairly stable and um so as parents as wives as colleagues you do not want to put yourself in a position where people can manipulate you because the one thing that is certain is that you would react you would react to something but if people are used to the fact that you don't necessarily react you are more when something happens you think about it and you decide what you want to do then you are not as easy to manipulate so some of us were in abusive relationships also because i'm not ex please don't get me wrong i'm not excusing the abuser but i'm just saying that some sometimes because we're on that emotional roller coaster it's easy for us to be manipulated because they an abuser some knows how to manipulate knows how to manipulate and sometimes when they bring you to a place where you're emotionally unstable you become easier to abuse because you're easier to manipulate you're easier to begin to doubt yourself all your emotions can are easier to pull out your anxiety the anxiety you're feeling the fear you're feeling the worry you're feeling the, they know that once i do this you feel okay again and you feel loved again and you feel and tomorrow if i do this i can easily do this and shebi is this person shebi is yemi i'll just all i need to do is do this and i have her number that makes it easier for you to be manipulated so it's um i don't know the 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 best way to work is always to work with is always to work with them um, with an awareness of yourself if you're a as a mature woman as a woman you need to go go into we all need to go into a place of maturity and the first place of maturity is to become, to become self-aware and to recognize that you are all over the place with your emotions you should get angry over every little thing fine we may have things from our background that makes us react in a particular way but like mommy said you just need to sit down and say to yourself this is not serving you this anxiety that i'm feeling is not serving me anxiety serves you when it causes you to focus on a problem and deal with it it is no longer serving you when you can't focus beyond that problem and it becomes the reason why you are feeling up and down because you're anxious you can't sleep any emotion that steals for, that takes from your relationship that is from your relationships that takes away trust in your relationships that takes away stability in your relationships that emotion definitely is not serving you and it will keep fluctuating back and forth now the best way to operate is like i said with a rational mind the bible says in second peter 1 3 it says according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and to virtue. The one thing that we know as human beings is that we have the ability to operate in the rational mind. Like I said, everybody has the rational mind. Everybody has the emotional mind. Everybody has the ability to develop the wise mind. A wise mind is a mind that takes your emotions and takes your um, facts and information and combines it so that you are not cold and you can listen to people empathically you can communicate your information empathically you're not devoid of emotion you feel all the emotions that you need to feel not this is not about killing your emotions because that makes you a false person if you're an emotional person i'm a very emotional person but i've learned to manage and to control my emotions if you do not learn to manage and control your emotions you're different sorry somebody who is learning to manage and controlling their emotions is different from somebody who is denying their emotions when you're denying your emotions, you're denying yourself and turning yourself into somebody that you're not. And one day you will snap. So it is not about I'm angry, but I'm keeping quiet. It is about 
this thing makes me angry, but I'm not going to react in an angry manner. I'm going to think about it, figure out what I need to do to resolve this issue. Two different things. I don't know if I'm making sense to anybody. So I always find Zoom meetings a bit weird because I'm a conversationalist. I'm not really a teacher. So I like to talk to people. So I'm finding it difficult to... to um, Okay, I'll keep my camera oh. on so that you know that at least someone is listening to you. <laughs> Thank I've been you. I've taking yes. notes both here. <laughs> Thank you. I just need to know that I'm making sense and I'm not just talking off points. So if we go to the book of Jonah in the Bible, Jonah was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. God was going to use him to do mighty things. God wanted to use him to turn Nineveh around. God had sent him to Nineveh go and talk to Nineveh. But Jonah was a very emotional, impulsive man. The first thing he did was to go in the opposite direction because you know what, God? I know for a fact that you are making a mistake because you are not a, I know that you are not a consistent God because that's how we explained it later. I know you are not consistent. You will tell me to go and tell them to do this and then you will change your mind. I know that you are not consistent. So he was talking as it were from facts assuming that God is a God that operates in the rational only. But because God is a father, he's a husband to some people, he's a father to some people, he's in relationships. So he has, he, he is able to operate out of a wise mind. So he can scold. And at the same time, but he's not out of, I am angry. Remember when he wanted to destroy Israel and Moses had to plead on behalf of Israel because for once, it looked as if God was going to operate out of an emotional mind. This is how I feel. And and um, what's it called? Moses took him back to himself and said, God, you are not like this. This is not your nature. And God reverted to type. And so Jonah was thinking, look, I know how you are. I know that you just say things without doing. So let me act. This is how I feel. I'm not about to waste my time. And he began to get angry. And then he ran away in an opposite direction. What happened? He got swallowed by the whale. He became very sad. Oh, I cried out to the Lord. I'm so sorry for what I've done. I, this, you know, despair, which is also an emotion. He felt sorry. For, it was an emotion. He felt despair. I don't know if he felt sorry, but he felt despair. You know, he prayed. God answered him. Forgetting that he had done something wrong and God had reverted true to type and had forgiven him and God sent him on the errand again. And then God sent him on the errand and um, people of Nineveh, Nineveh fasted and prayed and they repented and he changed his mind. And what happens? Jonah reverts to his emotional, um, being his emotional status. Being righteous, you know, sometimes our emotions, just like Mami had said, we can justify, you can justify your emotions in any number of ways. His own was righteous indignation. God, you are not making sense. You are going to disgrace yourself. So I want to help you. I'm trying to help you to remain God. It's a rational thing. The, your image of God is about to be, to be shattered or the impression that you have about God is going to be shattered. So God, instead of disgracing you, disgracing yourself, don't worry, I will help you. You know, it sounds like, oh, this sounds, of, but in reality, sometimes that is how we are. And he became very angry. Not even because God did something to him. Forgetting, once again, like I said, so this is the inconsistency in the emotions. Forgetting that he had done something wrong and God had forgiven him, sent him back on that errand. God forgave Nineveh. He got angry and said, you know what, just kill me. I know you just want to disgrace me. I don't know how many of you had that conversation with your parents when you were growing old. When you were growing up, you, you don't disgrace me. You want to disgrace me. You went to your cousin's house and you disgraced me. You did this and you disgraced me. And that is how Jonah felt and just reacted in that way. And he went in a particular way. And God, he got to a place he was tired and was God still dealt with, uh, still, you know, had mercy on him. God being consistent, not dealing out of an emotional mind, but out of a wise man. This is my child. This is my son. I have sent him on an errand. He's not sure what to do. I would still help him. It doesn't mean that I hate him. So I will still help him. And then he did, God gave him um, something to um, shield him from the, from the um, sun and all that. And then God sent a worm just to show him that, you know what, this is, and that's sometimes consequences. So 
the fact that you don't want to get angry doesn't mean that you can't you doesn't that's why i said the difference between swallowing your anger and not doing anything and actually just managing your anger and doing what you need to do and so god put a warm me just to show him that look i can cover and i can uncover and then the man who said just kill me was suddenly like do you want to kill me was all this jonah was so inconsistent so it doesn't mean that you cannot function in life jonah was a prophet he was functioning as a prophet god was using him but he was very inconsistent so you can imagine how if you were Jonah's wife. Can you put, picture yourself as Jonah's wife walking with him through this journey? Let's assume that obviously he was walking alone, but can you imagine if you were a member of his family, his son, his daughter, or his wife walking along? What would your impression be of Jonah? You will not trust him. You will not trust his relationship with God. You will not even believe in the things he says about God. Everything about him suddenly becomes untrustworthy because he's very unstable. One time he's thinking God is powerful. One time he's thinking God is a forgiving God. Next he's angry because God is a forgiving God. Then he says, God, kill me. Then God says, I won't kill you. I will protect you. Then next he says, you might as well kill me now. Why do you want to kill me? But he was, you know, and that is how sometimes as wives we behave. And sometimes as Especially sometimes because we're dealing with an adult, we may not necessarily behave like that. But when it comes to our children, because they can't, they may not be able to respond, you know, they may not be able to respond to you. Then it becomes a major factor, you know, and then you just respond. And you're thinking to yourself, how? So let me tell you the effects that this unstable mind has with people around you. When you're raising children, your emotions make them more prone to manipulation. They become manipulative themselves and they become more prone to manipulation and they themselves become unstable because train your child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. It's just a principle. It's not, this is, it has nothing, I don't want to say it has nothing to do with scripture, but it is just a principle of life. If you talk to any family psychologist, every adult on this planet is a part of who they are today, is a function of what they saw and what they lived through growing up. Not necessarily what their parents told them. As if there's any educator here, they will tell you that kids learn more by watching and observing than by actually what you tell them, you know. So in the lives of your children, you're raising, you're going to be raising children who, who are easy to manipulate because with your emotions, you manipulate them. So you can imagine if people have to walk around you all the time because you are upset, you, because you can get upset. That means they can't share certain things with you. They become secretive. They become this because they don't, they don't trust your reaction to stop because they don't know that you're able to react in the way that will help them because they, you see everything in light growing up i remember so i don't know how old anybody is here but in my own generation to have a boyfriend in form even in university itself was a was a struggle you know it would be like i met a boy the first thing your my mom would tell you is that eh have you finished school better go and finish your school and what's it called my father on the other hand like i said he was not an emotional person my father wanted to meet all our friends he wanted to meet, you know, he was, so when I was in year one and I started dating, I could, I found it easy to talk to my father. I just told my father, you know, he came to my room one day and I was just saying, and I said, oh, if you wait about five minutes, there's somebody I would like you to meet. I could never, ever have had that conversation with my mom growing up. So what it means is that I had a different relationship because I couldn't trust my mom's reactions. For my father, I could trust because my father was also very strict, but he was a rational, strict man. He was very yes, do this. This is how it should be. So uh, when I told him I had a boyfriend, why do you have a boyfriend? So this is this. He told me he didn't really think I should have a boyfriend. I'm too young to have a boyfriend. My mom would not have had that conversation. It would just be, I see you, what your plan is to disgrace me by getting pregnant now. You know, and that is the way a lot of, in my generation in Nigeria, that's how a lot of parents, a lot of particularly mothers were. And so you find that for, I could only tell her what I felt that she could handle in her emotions. So I, would, I became secretive with her. And if you're raising a daughter, 
it means that you are teaching them how to be secretive and not how not to be how to be completely how not to be completely open because they have to manage your emotions as well as manage their own activities their own emotions and all that now let's come to the husband as wives your husband cannot predict how you how you behave today he gives you a gist you find it very funny very hilarious tomorrow he forgets that he has given you the gist and tells you the gist but because your friend told you something about you you just heard something on instagram or you read the story it's like hey so who told you who and it's a fight and you're wondering and then the man is wondering ah, okay so next time i won't send this joke to you i won't tell you about this gist. you have already put a barrier because he cannot predict it's a different thing if he knows you don't like this kind of thing my husband finds some things funny he knows that i don't find them funny but he still pastors in church or you know where you know we can't really be circulating this thing we just like eh, am i circulating it's just you i'm sending it to now and everything i will laugh but i can't get ang i don't get angry because he is who he is and that's another thing about being on an emotional roller coaster you forget that people have, are who they are you you tend you're focused on yourself and on how on how you you um how you interpret things how things affect you so somebody is telling you um you're reporting an event that happened so why some wives are guilty of this and i see it on tv as well your husband is telling you about a colleague that did something bad he has forgotten about it next thing you people go for office cocktail the colleague greets you and you don't answer because in your mind you are thinking you're being emotional because the it has it has nothing to do with you so guess what Next time, your husband will be like, so I shouldn't bother to be telling you about things that happened in my office. I and he won't tell you. You begin to go distance. And then you're wondering why suddenly conversation has dried up between the two of you. Because he cannot determine how you react to things, how you react to things, how you react to events. You can't, you know, I remember once we had a couple over for dinner and um, we were we're just in about some some guy some girl they were just in about some girl i didn't know the girl and they were saying oh they can't believe that after she left this person for this person and i was like ah man i can't believe all that because that other guy is very hot and you know he's just like you know that other guy is a dangerous you know you know the kind of girls the kind of guys that girls like you know he's a bad boy he has a bad boy image and everything has dead dreadlocks you know and all that and this other guy is very straight very strict very i said ah, me i can't believe it because the other guy is very hot radio silence so after like 30 seconds to one minute the girl now whispered to me that ah, so are you not afraid that your husband will take offense i said ah the fact that he knows that i know that he's not the sexiest man alive there are other people who are so if you think and i know that he knows that and i know that he doesn't think i'm the sexiest person alive the issue is does he think i'm going to act upon the fact that he's not the sexiest man alive, man alive? i'm not i'm not interested in any other man because we can talk about physical attributes i know nothing about the guy i'm just saying on the face of it too if this guy and this guy come and talk to me i will talk to this guy first you know and but guess what that small conversation that we had caused a quarrel between that couple when they got home she did not say what's it called the guy was like hey how how can and she was upset on behalf of my husband with me and she was reporting and they caused the quarrel and i couldn't understand it i have to say to her that you have serious problems though because you are fighting your husband over what i said to my husband i am not upset my husband is not upset my husband found it hilarious he understood what i was saying why are you it turns out that she's one of those women who don't like people look you know she's very check your phone all the time kind of wife and all that 
so she, very unstable and what's it called? And she's like, so I had the conversation with her. This was some years, but this was like, shock, it was shocked. Maybe I, I wasn't even up to a year married then. So like, hey, I was like, I will soon understand. I, was, I said, I don't understand what I'm going to understand, but you know, you need to be able to manage your emotions because you're allowing what happened in my house between my husband and I affect your own relationship. How? Me that it happened to, or my husband that it happened to, we're very okay with it. In fact, that night, because it was a fantastic dinner, we also had a fantastic night. I hope everybody here is married. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm trying to figure out what the problem is. But that is what emotional roller coaster does to you. You just react irrationally. So you can imagine, even me, when I'm with them, I'm very respectful of the kind of conversation I have because I also don't want anybody to now, what if the husband now uses his own emotional mind to have a conversation with my husband and push him more towards the emotional mind instead of the wise mind. So I have to be mindful of the conversation that I have and all that. So we've talked about how it influences, how it affects people. If you are on a roller coaster journey with your emotions, Number one, understand that it affects everybody in your life. And you cannot expect, put the body, and that means that you're putting the burden of a good relationship with you on them. Mm. Because they have to constantly manage you. And that is not a sustainable way to relate with people. That is number one. Number two is that you yourself, it will never serve you to have everybody dump whatever is going on in life, onto your own emotions, you will break down. You will become neurotic. You will become, you will just become a mess yourself. You may not realize it, but the more you allow things, the more of a roller coaster you go, eventually you stay high up and never come down. So you become perpetually angry. You become perpetually happy. You know, that's, I don't know if you've met anybody, because we keep talking about anger. I don't know if you've met people who are always excited and that, you know, you just wonder, you know, they're excited today, they're down to know that. And then after a while, you, you know, there's a friend I had to call her and say, not a friend, but someone, I had to call her one day to say, I just want to ask you a question. Please don't be upset. Do you take God's drugs to maintain this level of excitement? She said, no, she doesn't. Mm -hmm. That is just that, you know, he gets excited when she sees people. So when she's around and then, so when she, I saw him like, so do you get tired when you get home? She's like, oh yes, she does get tired. So it means when she gets home and she's tired, nobody, because she's high, low, high, low, high, low. It means that nobody in her family see her in that excitable state because by then she's drained physically. Because whatever emotion that we feel affects our physical body, whether it's anxiety. And that's why you see when people are stressed, they break out with um, pimples, acne, because we have, how many, am I still on track? I, th I think yes, I'm still within my time. Still okay. Still time okay. So how many, you know, you have, um, you, when you're stressed, you break out with acne because all these things affect your physical body. When you're super excited, when you have a fantastic day and you're, you know, I don't know whether anybody has, maybe on the, when you got married, maybe by the next day you're drained. I don't know if you can remember your wedding day and how excited you were. Hopefully you were excited how excited you were and all that. And then by the end of the day, you're drained and you're so tired. It's not because you actually physically did anything, but because emotions actually engage you and they, they take a toll on you because your body, things are released into your system. If you're constantly angry, you have um, hormones that go into your system as well to keep you on that level of anger. Your adrenaline level is very high. So you're angry, you're tired, you have headaches constantly. You know, different things happen to you. So apart from how it affects other people, it affects you. So now let, let's now talk about actually working in the wise mind. Like Mami said, it takes a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. You have to slow down. You have to make a conscious decision that, you know what? I need to slow down on my emotions. I need to slow down in the way I get angry. You have to... Sometimes, if you, if you don't, under, in fact, if you're always constantly tired, 
perhaps this is the time to ask people mm. about yourself because sometimes self-awareness comes you may think you know yourself self-awareness also comes from when you talk to other people and you say give me a feedback do you think emotionally I'm stable? Do you think I'm always, I get angry too quickly? Do you think I'm always too excitable when I speak? Do you think, if you ask questions, and if you ask questions and people are used to how you respond, because you know, we talked about the fact that sometimes you also be, people may not trust you. But if you, you promise you want to that too, I'm sorry? They will tell you what you want to hear. They will tell you what you want to hear or not tell you anything at all. But if you assure them that you're on a journey of change, on your journey of self-discovery, people would respond to you. So just, you don't need to ask the whole world, just one or two people that you trust and what's it called? How, I, how am I emotionally? Do you think I'm stable? And people will say, eh, yeah, you get angry, you fly off the handle, you get too anxious easily, you get worried easily. And then you now begin to focus on, so these are the things that I need to change about myself. Like I said, we are all emotional people. We are all prone to certain kinds of emotions, but we can manage it. I want to take us back to Second Peter first, um, one three, that talks about that says, according to, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. I want to talk about that life. Mommy said something. You have to choose. Mm -hmm. When Moses was talking to the Israelites and he was giving them the law, the laws and everything. It said, yeah, he said, I place before you, I present to you life and death. Choose life that you may live. You need to make a choice. God will not, no matter how much you pray, God will not come and make a choice to change for you. You have to take that first step and he can give you the strength. And according to the scripture that we just said, read, he has already given you what you need to go on that journey of changing yourself, of becoming a more stable person. You need to make that choice. Because one, it makes you healthy. I'm just going to go through. I'm just going to go through a few, um, a few, when you have a, when you're thinking from your wise mind, um, as wanted, you don't even attack, you know, when you go, I don't know if you've been in before, when um when you go for a meeting and it feels as if everybody came to deal with you or maybe the next thing he's having a talk with you you're thinking ah you obviously came prepared to have that what's it called but when you have a mind, wise mind you you move away from that i'm feeling attacked or confronted and you're calm you you and the more you exercise this it takes to be honest Every human being, because God has given that thing, us that power, you know, for everything that pertains to life, we all have what it takes to operate from a wise man. You can do all things. The Bible says if you're a Christian, the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. If you're not a Christian, you have the potential to have a mind that is constantly stable. Because we're created by God and in his likeness, God is not an emotional God. He is not also, he's also not a... Um, He's not, he doesn't operate out of the rational mind either. He's very empathic. He understands emotion, but he acts in a way that is. And when your mind is clear, you are able to choose, make right decisions, choose rightly. You're, you become more sensitive to people around you. As a mother, if you have a child that is really young, that is still trying to figure their way out in life, you become more sensitive to how you raise them. You know, as a mother, there's some things, if you're constantly, you know, you're irritated by everything, today you're high, tomorrow. But if you understand, if you take time to start operating out of that, you can raise your children to the full potential that they have. Because they, you have 10 children, you have 10 different human beings, mm -hmm. 10 personalities, 10 different things, because they all interpret the same way. And the worst part of operating from, the best part of operating from a rational mind is that they will probably see you in a consistent manner all across 10 children. Mm -hmm. But if you're emotional, no. The, a child that has joined you on that journey of emotional will see you different from a child who, has, who cannot operate out of emotional. That child will not know how to relate with you. And therefore, you'll have a distant relationship. But if, you're, if you choose to remain like that, if you choose to change 
the way you really uh, and begin to relate to each child not emotionally but according to what you according to the person of the child according to the person of your husband according to the to the person of your friend or your colleague you're going to have a fantastic time also it increases your capacity to tolerate what happens in life the more you journey on that thing the more when things happen to you so i'll give you my mom you remember i said she used to be very emotional and everything if you tell my mom but if you give my mom bad news or if she's upset the first thing she has is a runny tummy remember i told you about how emotions affect your physical what's it called is a runny tummy and everything and then she had this accident that made her even more emotionally unstable because she was now motivated constantly by fear. So you're traveling. If you make the mistake of telling my mom that you're traveling, even if you are traveling out of the country by plane, my mom will sit as if somebody has died, waiting for somebody to confirm that they have seen you. One day I have to tell her that, mommy, surely if you're traveling from Lagos to London, you will know together with the whole world that I did not arrive because it will be national news that the plane dropped from the sky. But now, my mom is a different person. She has, through her work in Christ, she has been able to increase her, in fact, her capacity to tolerate things. Now, when things happen, my mom is so blasé about it. She's like, eh, okay, so what do we do? I think we should do, before, we, we even as kids, we used to shield my mom from things. Because she was constantly operating out of her emotions, not out of this. You, so you're, you become emotionally resilient. And the best part of it, you improve the quality of every single relationship that you have. Whether it is with your colleagues, whether it is with your house helps, whether it is with your, for those of us in Africa, you have domestic staff. Whether it is with your domestic staff, whether it is with your children, your husband, you improve significantly the quality of the relationships that you have with everybody. And so I think I would just like to leave you to, with a few questions that you should ask yourself after this event. Mm. Reflect on what can you do today to develop the growth of a wise mind, the wise part of your mind. Don't forget that the wise part looks at the facts, doesn't focus on the emotion or just comes together to find a solution that will work in every situation. What steps do you think you can take today? Today, For people who get angry, maybe something as just deciding that when you're angry, you will not say a word. No matter the provocation, you will not say a word. A word includes not sending that text. You know, you'll just be mute. That can be a step. That is one of the steps that you can take. Then I want to ask you again that what's in your, sorry. If you think about yourself now and your, how your emotions are, I want you to think of how your life would significantly improve if you could, if you would not operate in your emotions, that is what will drive your change. That will, you know, like Mami said, she had seen her mom, she saw where she was going and she had to sit herself down. So you need to think to yourself, if I am not this emotional, if I don't operate out of my emotions all the time or a lot of times, what will my life be like? What will the key relationships in my life be like? Please ask yourself these questions because those are the things that will drive you towards change. If you're, you can't just change because you've come for this seminar, you will change because you have seen in your life the reason why you need to make a change. And so I think I am, I have concluded. I hope that, um, Thank you. I hope that I made sense to everybody. I hope everybody had something they could take away from it. In who I've been writing and writing and writing here. I have I've learned so 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 much. And one thing that keeps I, I, I've seen one key word is self-awareness. It starts with mm -hmm. self-awareness. Um and 
another one that I actually picked is um, the wise mind. You know, there's the extreme of the rational mind, extreme of the emotional mind, having a wise mind. Okay, but I have a question. Would you say mm -hmm. a wise mind is the um, same thing as what we call emotional intelligence? It's, it's part of it. It's part of it. Emotional intelligence means that you're aware of things around you, of people around you, and you're responding to all of them without being led by all of them. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's part of it. The key is that you're not being led by your emotions, but you're also not being led strictly by facts and information because that leaves you cold and cruel. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've met people like that in life who they just say it as it is. They don't care how you receive it. They don't care you just say it. We've had bosses like that. We've had colleagues like that. We've had teachers like that. Mm. They don't mean to be cruel, but that's how it comes across. Mm. So yes, emotional intelligence is being aware, being more aware in tune with other people's emotions, being aware with the atmosphere around you, the environment around you that you are creating and that people are creating around you. Yeah, interesting. One question I had is, is how this... Um, Managing emotions affect our parenting, and you actually address that very well. You know, there are things, there are ways we behave or emotions that we express that we don't know are silently like seeping into our kids and affecting, you know, the way they they are affecting their development. And um, I'm happy you touched on that. Um, but there's something um, one there's one that I needed to also like further expand on and that's um emotions as the impact career advancement because i know a lot of ladies you know will complain and say oh i was supposed to be promoted or maybe there's a leadership position or something does this have anything to do with this whole emotion thing or what do you, what are your thoughts around that or an advice to someone out there who may actually need to improve on their you know emotional um, balance, you know, to get ahead in their career? I think it has. For starters, if you're, if you're functioning in a role and you haven't learned to manage your emotions, it means that at work you, you'll probably also be very erratic or be viewed, you know, as being emotional. And unfortunately, unfairly, women are already have, we have that categorization mm -hmm. and we've been put in the box of emotional so you need to work extra hard to show that you are not but in terms of career advancements you the truth is like i'll give you an example so I much earlier on in my career, I worked in an organization that I loved. I loved my job and everything. I had a boss that honestly, till today, she molded for me what, what, I should, what a boss should not be. She kind of like guided me to, this is the kind of boss I must never be. Mm -hmm. She was lazy. She was unfair. She was lazy. She was unfair. She was... Um, she wouldn't take responsibility for her actions. She, you know, she was backstabbing. She was a lot of things. She would take credit for your work. She was just a lot of things. But guess what? Despite all of it, I was working in a function that I hadn't worked before. So when I started that role, I was, so I remember you said, Omori, when you were reading my CV and, you know, you read about chartered accountant and all that, I said, oh, wow, what an interesting, you know, very disjointed what's it called so i started life as a chartered accountant so i was in payroll and that's how i got into this organization to work in payroll but very quickly because i had a creative mindset mm -hmm. i became the head of the group heads almost like a pa in terms of strategy because that was the first organization in nigeria that started to do strategic hr so i was learning so much I could easily have resigned because like I said, she had so many, she denied me promotion. She, you know, all kinds of things, everything to make her progress. And I would say, and she, she knew I didn't like her because I told, during appraisal, I told her how I felt about what to call. But guess what? It didn't make me change my job. It didn't make me 
even with what has really gone because guess what i was learning a lot i was very focused on what i needed to learn and that's also that is operating out of the wise mind yeah. so when you start to act out because you're not being promoted because you, because um things not going your way it's not you can leave you can choose to leave but don't leave in a way you don't burn bridges you don't burn bridges with you know anywhere you are in the world with whatever burning bridges simply means a lot of a number of times sometimes, sometimes you really have to burn a bridge but most times it's because we're operating out of an emotional mind because guess what so i've met you today i've met mommy today on um, this web um, webinar and so i decided well she said something and you know we kind of like have a, a mini altercation and i said well i don't even like the way she talks and i'm never going to talk to her again mm. what happens if if uh, tomorrow i need her a person who can really talk about it and blah 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 but i've burnt that bridge so in career advancement i think it's important that we 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 focus on why we are in a job if you know the why of something then you're more you're better served by focusing on the how to get to your goal as opposed to how you feel about the journey not all journeys are pleasant if you recall also, I don't know if anybody, everybody has um, studied the Bible, but if you recall in Hebrews, it talks about, when it talks about, when it was talking about Jesus Christ, it talked about for the joy that was set before him, you know, he went through the course. It was not, there's a journey and you have a goal. So with everything, even in your career, if you have a vision, if that's the only place where you can learn, then you better stay there and ignore everything and just understand that. Focus on the bigger picture. That's my take on it. Yeah. Thank you very I'm much. I'm sorry? I said focusing on the bigger picture. Yes. Focusing on the bigger picture. That's very, that's very helpful for me, and I believe somebody else too has learned. But um, I think I have a question for Mami. Um, when did you know that, like, you had, shall I say, should I say made significant progress? Like, what did you see that made you say, wow, oh, I've actually improved? Can you tell us what? Is mommy there? Okay, sorry. Uh -huh. you, that question is from you, right? Yes, it's for you. Like, what, what did you see that made you realize that you've actually, like, grown? Like, you've gotten to, like, a... a, a I, I know it's a journey for all of us anyway, in terms of... I don't want to say you've gotten there, but at least you've made significant progress. What, what was the experience? What did you see that made you, you know, get to that? Okay, so one interesting thing I noticed also about um, growth is that it's weird. So, you know, you would say you don't want to do something anymore and um, you feel like, okay, like, I think I've changed because maybe you'd have that same situation would have presented itself and you'd have, you acted very differently, right? Now, sometimes in that moment where you now think that, oh, yes, something, I don't know, it happens to me. Something happens around that same time, but it catches me by surprise because I'm not expecting it. And then I'm like tested on the same thing that I feel like I've improved from. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, hmm, my reaction happens. But the good thing is that sometimes it's not as bad as it would have been. So I think it's when it catches you by surprise mm. and you see your reaction and it's not the, maybe it's not as great as you hoped it would be, but it's better. Sometimes give yourself some credit. I don't know. Sometimes we are not, we, we put up, like we are so hard on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. With a standard. I think growth is like, it's incremental. Mm -hmm. So before I'll be so hard on myself and I'll be like, ah, I should have done better. This thing caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. But at least I look at the little progress I've made in that space that's why i spoke about the love and fear so um and the self-awareness thing because maybe it would be why didn't this person pick my call hmm you know there has to be so maybe you call 10 times mm -hmm. and then i'm like no i'm not going to react or you send a long message or some voice note or something and then maybe in that space maybe you're not calling 10 times you call just two times Mm. it's progress mm -hmm. and it's okay to stand in that and even say thank you the gratitude in that small progress you've made and that's when you when you are thankful with a little progress you can make more progress so that's one thing i would say thank that you. answers your question yeah 
you know, being intentional one and and appreciating or giving yourself credit for the little progress that you made is there are practical steps to take actually to, to get in there. Okay, so we have a question um, here. I, it says, um, I've had a lot of emotional outbursts and hurts and hurts many relationships along the way. What are the steps I can take to heal and repair some of these relationships which are vital for my marriage, business, and family? Um, um, Diami, do you, do you want to take it or will mommy, who wants to go first? This person wants, um, what, are the okay. steps, what are the steps that she can take to heal and repair some of these relationships which are vital for her marriage and business and family as a whole? Yeah. I think the, the most important step that she can take is to be honest with the people mm -hmm. and say, look, I acknowledge that this is how you know this is how i've been in this relationship i would like to apologize and i would like to what can i do to heal this relationship mm. that is one secondly you must give the relationship time to heal by being consistent in what you what you have what you now want to do because mm. what you're saying is like i said earlier trust what you know tr this this affects trust. So once trust is broken, like in any other thing in life, you have to work to re-earn that trust. So don't expect that the fact that you have apologized means that they should accept the apology and everybody moves on. They need to see that you're consistent in your new behavior for you to, to, um, for you to actually, for the relationship to heal. Yeah. And... If you fall off the wagon, you need to be honest to say, I've fallen off the wagon. I realize I am sorry again. I am really trying to, um, to make amends here. That's what I can. That's really, that's practical. <laughs> that's practical. Mami, do you want to say, you want to add to what? The, yeah, yeah um, I would say that, like, Yes, of course. Um, like what Sayemi said, it's very accurate. I think the best form of apology is change behavior. Mm -hmm. the, the terrible thing about also being emotional is that how quick you want people to get over it. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, hmm, it's taking long. Like, you know, I remember I'll be like, why is it taking you so long? Why can't you get over the thing fast? I've changed, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't even have to tell them that you've changed. You say sorry and you now take the steps to make the, the change. I believe that people who genuinely want to be in your life, who care for you, will, um, will see that change and, and, and accept it. Don't um, put too much pressure on the process of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I believe that even sometimes in your little mistakes, I'm not trying to say it's right to make mistakes, but even your small outbursts, if people walk away and you say you're sorry and they don't come back, it's okay. Life goes on. You'll get a second chance to do better. When it comes to business, you always get a new chance. You see, life is very interesting. Um, these are even universal principles that things will always, it's like, it's like I said, if you don't pass the class, you'll keep repeating it over and over again. Mm -hmm. Life will give you another opportunity to make amends. And it may not even be in that same space. Maybe you'll not be in business, but I'll cut it for family. If you can pass in family, you can pass it in the business space. So sometimes, you know, don't even miss opportunities. Say, okay, maybe I missed, and this is just a quick one. I messed up in with a person in the business space. So now you want to reconcile there. Okay. Now it's taking longer. I went with the person to get over it. Okay. Sometimes God has an interesting way of giving you a test in another area you think is insignificant. And it can be with a family member or someone so random. And in that space, be willing to grow even in the areas that you think don't matter. Because when it's sharing the content of family, I'm telling you, once you can get it right with your siblings, with your loved ones, you can get it right with other people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, like I said, secondly, don't put pressure on the reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But the best way is that like you've changed, you apologize, and you give it time and allow time to work everything else out for you. I hope that answers the question for whoever asked. Give it time. And it's also being selfish when you expect everyone to be back, you know, on mm -hmm. track immediately. That's yeah being selfish thank you very much thank you so much um there's one other thing i want to i want to raise um and it's really really important and it's a major question that came up from i think our last um, wife's gist 
and someone asked her, how can she become friends with her husband? And I know it's me. I, I think from my little experience and my interaction with people, that's a major question, a major thing that a lot of couples are dealing with. How do you become friends with your husband? And I believe there's some some part of it that is tied to your emotional, your being able to manage or control your emotions. Sayemi mentioned that if your husband cannot predict your reactions to certain things, and no, that's all, it's not everything he, he can gist with you. It's not everything he can bring to the table. He's not free around you. He's walking around you circumspectly, like the Bible would say. You know, like you, ha you have like bottles, are broken bottles around you. I know. Um, I don't know, if Sayemi, if you can give like some further advice, you know, around helping women, you know, become friends with their their spouse, their husbands. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I would ask whoever asked this and for as many people as this applies to is um what's what is what is it that makes you friends with somebody how do you relate to your friends if you can answer that and i think i speak for generally a lot of us we are very accommodating of our friends but somehow we are not as accommodating of our spouses mm. so our friends would say things and do things and we won't even think we won't even think of being offended we find it funny but if it comes from our spouse suddenly world has been declared you know and what it speaks to is how open are you in your or how accepting are you or if you're if you're in a relationship with somebody that doesn't accept you for who you are how much of a friend do you think you would want to be with that person yeah. And it's the same with marriage. You need to be, you need to, you need to place yourself in a position where it's easy to be friends with. You need to be more open. A lot of women are very closed, particularly in a lot of families, you have women that are probably more, they'll be more church going and more what's it called. So we're more, we tend to be more judgmental. And then because we're also more, we think about other things outside of the basic things men men are more two-dimensional if that's the word and we are more three so we tend to think about all kinds of things and we judge people we judge our spouses based on how we are and how we see but if you understand that your spouse whether you're male whether uh, whether you know it's your um whether this is the husband or the wife now if you begin to be more accepting it means that you are able to have more conversations if you're less judgmental, think about it. If you have a friend who will judge you on everything, are you likely to be that close to your friends? Are you likely to be that? So the way I see it is that for a lot of women, for I don't know, for some reason, we've lost focus of the fact that relation, marriage is also a relationship issue. Mm. The way you are friends with your friends, with your girlfriends, mm. is the way you should be friends with your husband. Be very, more accepting be more accommodating. It's not everything that affects life and death. Mm. Unless it affects something central to your marriage. You are quarreling because he likes to watch a match all the time. Mm. So how about making your house, turning your house into a sporting, into a sports club on match days? If that is the, that is, that means you're accepting. And the more you accept the person, you accept his friends, you accept his, the way he is, the more the person becomes more open to you and the more intimate and friendlier you can become. That's just a basic principle of connecting in any kind of relationship that I know. Thank you very much. So we, ha we have two more questions. Um, the last question we answered regarding um, um, repairing relationships that have been uh, kind of destroyed based on emotional issues. Um, the person says, I understand all you have said, but I'm still deeply hurt and bitter about most of these experiences. How do I deal with this? Um, Mike, you want to go first? Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, me? Oh, <laughs> okay. I think um, one thing I will say is that I, like for me, I had a time when I was, I think I felt like I had handled something very poorly and I had apologized. So I don't know if it's about the same feeling like you've apologized and maybe you are hurt. So is it like guilt then that the person is, if it's guilt or the bitterness or hurt from how you've handled them, you have to forgive yourself first then. Because also um, the truth of the matter is like, you can never even forgive anybody or move forward if you can't forgive yourself, knowing that you are not perfect and you are growing. And I think that I remember for, so for me personally, I know that I had my impulsive nature, which cost me some, um, maybe some friendships or something. And then and I would feel very bad about it because the idea was more about keeping the friendship than who I was becoming. Now, sometimes, so the fixation now becomes, so if you're not careful, when it's hard to get over things, that means you have to ask yourself, what are you holding on to as the ultimate? Is it those people or your personal growth? That means that the people are still determining the state of your state of being. They are more, they are taking a level of importance over even you yourself. Because at the end of the day, if something has happened and you regret and you want to see change, when you forgive yourself, you have to now come to a place where no human being, and after this, this is the honest truth, whether it's your spouse or is more important, right? Than, and it's not like a selfish way because it says love your neighbor as yourself, right? So at the end of the day, it's like you are placing other people or how they feel about you over yourself. You, even if you mend those relationships, you will have the same problem over again because those people will still be determining how you feel about you. You can never, you can only determine how you feel about you. And so, yes, you're hurt and you feel bitter about how things played out. But the most important thing about life is that your personal growth is key. Mm -hmm. And you see, the thing is that we want to control outcomes, right? But the, our goal is not to control, because that's anxiety, you're trying to control, okay, now I feel really bad because I want everything to be back to normal or to be fixed. That's an outcome. You can't control that. You always not have peace. But it's the thing of now, the only thing you can control is your personal growth, how you are responding to even the process taking maybe long or even how you're feeling about the fact that you messed up. So you have to take, like, um, take back the power, right? Even from anybody you've hurt. You know, some man said he had cheated on the wife and he had been saying sorry and the woman kept going on and on, the infidelity, the infidelity. And the counselor said, the best this man can do is tell you he's sorry. He can't change what happened. So at the end of the day also, um, he has to forgive himself. And then the woman has to choose. Give everybody a chance you've hurt, a chance to choose you, mm -hmm. that they genuinely want to be in your life. Mm -hmm. And you have to choose yourself. And choosing yourself is choosing the best for you, that you are growth, so that you can do better in that space. I hope I've answered it the best way I can. Mm -hmm. But I think like, you know, um, yeah, I don't know, Stay you will probably say something. With. <laughs> no, I think you've answered it. You've answered it accurately. What you want to do, I don't know if you recall when I said you always want to ask yourself, is this emotion serving you? So when you're saying you're, whole, you're so bitter and hurt about these experiences, the hurt and the bitterness, is it serving you? If it's not serving you, then it's totally useless. And you just need to speak to yourself and get rid of it. That's just it. There's no, there's no let's not faff around and you know i could tell you oh you know you need to give yourself process to hurt yes you need to give yourself time to heal but if you're saying that you're still about because the question says about most of these experiences you need to figure out for yourself is it that holding on to this hurt and the experience is it is it what are you deriving from it sometimes this holding on to things helps us to justify a lot of other things in our life so it's easier to hold on to those things so that we can justify why certain things are certain, you know, are going in a particular way. So you need to figure out for yourself why it's difficult for you to let go of these things. And honestly, you just have to make a choice. You will not remain in this hurt and bitter situation because, unless, of course, like I said, it's serving you. That's it. Thank you. The questions are for you. We have um, another one it says that I always feel like I look weak if I don't address things as they are. It's 
like being intellectually um, challenged. Mm -hmm. People are, often take advantage of this. How do I gauge my responses? My husband would rather let things just slide, which is not acceptable. This is the no nonsense woman. Um, so I would say, first of all, when you say something is not acceptable, acceptable to who? Because this is, in itself has determined what your mindset is concerning issues. Accept, not acceptable to who? Because obviously it's acceptable to your husband. So you need to find out why is this acceptable to my husband? It could be because your, your responses are always so emotional that he just rather not have a confrontation with you. And not everybody, this in general, I can see that it looks like you, you, you're one of those people who, like you said, it's like you don't want, you don't want to be taken advantage of. But you need to figure out if this, what is, the fact that you don't respond emotionally does not mean that you will be taken advantage of. The fact that you don't respond at all may mean that you will be taken advantage of. But if you respond in, with a wise mindset, putting aside how I feel, this is the situation. Can we deal with this situation? And in dealing with this situation, when you're talking about your husband would rather let things slide, if he's the kind of person who, like, who prefers not to have confrontations, then you must figure out, am I communicating in the best way with my husband? Because if he lets things slide, it's not everything that he lets things slide. Because he didn't let it slide. He didn't, unless you were the one who proposed to him, got him to the wedding day. That means he's able to take actions for himself. He's able to reason. He probably just, maybe he just doesn't like communicating with you for whatever reason. I'm sorry to sound like that. But sometimes that may just be it. Sometimes we put ourselves in a position where because we just react all over the place, some people would just rather not do with something than, than what's going on. And then some people are more reactive than others. When he said you let, he lets it slide, does it mean that he does not do anything about the situation at all or he doesn't do it in the way that you want to do it, i.e. talk it out to death? So you need to figure the best way to communicate with your husband but you cannot the more you respond emotionally the more anybody who's with you would avoid a confrontation and it would look like they're trying to let things slide exactly, exactly. I, I think there's a difference between being firm and just or, or just reacting emotionally like there are certain circumstances where you need to draw bound, certain boundaries and things like that. Um, but it's not everything that you react from a place of emotion. Being firm, you are reacting from a place more, I'll say from a wise mind. I don't want to say more from the rational point of view. Um, but being firm, I think, is the, is the key here. In being firm, are you doing it? Or are you doing it emotionally or just reacting like, ah, no, I, I have to have the last and say here and i have to make my point here and things like that that's when it becomes an issue but being firm is you assess the situation and you can you know that okay i need to draw a boundary boundary here and you're not reacting immediately because you you need to process that thing and you come out and you make your firm stand um, um firm point but not necessarily emotional from an emotional um, place. That's what I believe anyway. Um, I have one last one here. It says I'm divorced and I've been very silent on many matters in my home and I feel my husband took advantage of this. Now, I, I now feel I always have to respond to any machinist type of attack generally from men. What's your advice on how to overcome this? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I think I'll go again. I'll repeat the question. It says, I am divorced and have been very silent on many matters in my home. And I feel my husband took advantage of this. I now feel I always have to respond to any machin machinist type of attack generally from men. What's your advice on how to overcome this? Hmm. Am I answering or is mommy answering? Okay, mommy. 
Um, do you want to go first or? Yeah, I could. I'll just drop something really quick. Okay. Um, just to say that um, you know, I have never. Well, I, I can't. I know a divorce is a very difficult thing. So one thing that I, from experience with different people, is that you know, obviously, it causes a lot of hurt, and there's so many things that come out of it. But you know, I drew from the number one thing where it says, I now feel, so now you're dealing with feelings, right? So number two, that I always have to respond. So now we're going with the other thing of the impulse, right? Now you're becoming reactive than uh, reflective. Then it says to any matches type of attack. So how do you know it's an attack? So that's perception. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you're coming from a place of hurt, you know, you've been through something, something that it shapes your reality. Even it will be in a situation whereby somebody is not even attacking you, but because of hurt, you want to protect yourself. You know, when we go through things, we are either coming from a place of, you see, a lot of fear does, right? Like the porcupine. The porcupine can see someone coming to pass and the person is not even doing anything, but they wrap themselves around ready to strike. And so all I'll just say for this one person is that when you're talking about overcoming, I think fundamentally healing is important. And the healing journey is really to say that you can never control how any man will speak or what he will do. He will operate from wherever they are operating, but you can control yourself. And the thing about healing is to always ask yourself that, am I responding? I spoke about fear or love, right? So the healing place will now begin to deal with things where you are, it will change your perception because perception is really formed about how we are interpreting the an external thing. And it may not always be the case, right? So um, I'm not sure this person is um, spiritual or not, but if you are spiritual, you know God, I will say fundamentally to pray. Healing takes different forms. It may take time, but always knowing that the work starts with you. You can never control how any man will behave or do anything. It always says if you want to change the world, you have to look in the mirror. It always starts from your inside, asking yourself that what is controlling how I feel? Why am I you know, feel I need to respond. Why am I scared? Why do I need to attack? That means attack comes from more fear. So I might want to protect myself from more, maybe from hurt. So that means there's a wound there. And you know, the healing, only God can really heal. And that may take time. But always to know that the problem may never come from those people, but always come from you. Taking the time to be, you know, in solitude, um, to pray, to just assess yourself, the self-awareness, and to let go and forgive. Mm -hmm. And then having a change and renewed mind so you can really begin to perceive your outside surroundings as what they are and not what you think they are. So that's what I would say. Hopefully it helps the person. Yeah. Fantastic. The person, it needs to, the person needs to learn to process how they feel for time and check if it's coming from a place of fear or love. And obviously to seek um, God for help in terms of healing. I believe as time goes on and you get healed, it gets better. Um, over to you, Sayemi, do you have? I think she, Mami just said, she just said this, uh, she said everything spot on. You need to, you need to heal, you need to allow yourself to heal. Mm -hmm. And part of the healing process is one, forgiving yourself because I can see from what, she, it looks like you're blaming yourself mm -hmm. for being silent. Mm -hmm. You need to figure out what you were silent on Mm -hmm. and forgive yourself if you feel that you need to forgive yourself mm -hmm. and you need to figure out whether you were being silent or you were not expressing you were not being emotional like mm -hmm. we had said you know over and over there's a difference between swallowing things up mm -hmm. and ignoring not acknowledging you know how things are making you feel and just suppressing and actually just being able to manage your emotions and moving on with things in the relationship you need to also like she said you need to understand that you are not all men would be like your ex mm -hmm. some men who even offer some kinds of opinions they honestly don't they don't even realize that they don't know better they don't realize it's not like they're trying to be mean or anything that's just based on what they the way they've been brought up and everything and you do not have to respond understanding that you do not have to respond to anything because response means you're being reactive you want to create a space between yourself where you're sure of who you are and then you begin to act out who you are and ignore 
like you said, you can't, you have absolutely no control over people's thoughts, how they feel about women, how they feel about issues. You have almost no control. You can try to educate people, but if that education at this moment is aggravating you, then just ignore them and focus on your own internal healing and mm. forgiving yourself for whatever part you think you played in being taken advantage of. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mami, and thank you so much, Diane, for for a very, very, very interesting time. I've taken a lot of notes, and um, I believe those on the on the webinar have also done the same and learned one or two things. And one important one I always say is being self-aware and not not living in your own bubble and thinking you've got it all sorted out and and wondering also on the other end why certain things are not going right in your life in your marriage the way you raise your kids um, and even at work many times it's tied to how we manage our emotions thank you very much once again i really appreciate um the time um just for just to wrap up in terms of um praying i think i would I would like for mommy to lead us in like a closing prayer. Let's pray for all of us here because we're all in this journey together. Over to you, mommy. Okay. Ah, uh, sure. Um, I don't know why this. I'll just say the words because it's a song that just came to my mind. Okay, and I know maybe my voice will probably sound good on Zoom. So, um. You know, maybe I'll just probably say the words, but it's the song where it says, um, no, it's well with my soul, right? And um, I don't know what anyone is dealing with right now. It talks about the soul is the seat of your emotions. And, you know, it's where we contend with so many things. We are even in a very different time in the world. There's been a shift. Many people cannot even see. People have lost their jobs. Life is just not the same. Even people had different coping mechanisms. They were going for events to deal with maybe stress at home. You were active at church just to deal with things. Now you are forced to face yourself. And it's another thing to face yourself when you see your weaknesses for what they are. But God is doing a pruning. He's working on us for the next phase of our lives. Because the world doesn't need any more intelligent people or smart people. It needs people with a soul, with a healthy soul, healthy mind. People who have a heart and compassion. People with character. Mm -hmm. And so I'll just, um, just like when you have your time, you can listen to the song as well with my soul. It's an affirmation, a declaration that it is well. So Father, I want to thank you that is well with our souls. We give you all the glory because where two or three are gathered, you are there in the amnesty. But God Almighty, even before the technology Zoom was ever made, you, oh God Almighty, had even instituted that any time we come and we gather with one heart and one mind, whether I was in the same place or not, you will honor that. We thank you for honoring today. We thank you for every need, every heart cry that has come through a question, even through a thought, even those we have not yet been able to form or formulate in our minds. Father God Almighty, we thank you that you are the prayer answering God. We thank you, O God Almighty, the one who is working in us to will and to do. We thank you, O God Almighty, that as women, we will live, O God Almighty, in the calling that you have placed us on this earth to be helpers, O God Almighty, to be problem solvers, to be comforters. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's a helper. What's the role that a helper plays? They come and then they, they support, they bring a change, they bring a shift. We thank that, oh God Almighty, as women, we are not aligning with our own will, but want to align with your purpose for our lives. We thank that, oh God Almighty, even by reason of this means, those who are not here, but even wherever this message will be heard, what we have shared today, because it's not being our flesh, but because of your own spirit, let hearts be changed, let families be changed, let marriages be changed, Oh God Almighty, we want to pray and we ask that we will see results. The gospel has power, oh God Almighty, power to transform and to bring results in our lives. We thank you, oh God. But even as we even leave this meeting and we go into our respective lives, we want to pray that we will see fruits bearing in our lives, in our children's lives, in our homes, in our business, in our nation, oh God Almighty, wherever we find ourselves in this world, that we will be fruit bearers, oh God Almighty, that will be an example.
example, a more accurate version of Christ, not an accurate version of ourselves because we are broken and we don't know the way. But today we ask the Lord Jesus, help us to become more self-aware. Holy Spirit, show us and teach us the uncomfortable and the nasty things about us. When you expose them, give us the grace to contend with them that we will seek not so much to be understood as to understand, mm -hmm. to love as to love. Our goal, oh God Almighty, will become that we will be love, mm -hmm. that we will become the representation of love on earth. And when we are love, we are not moved by circumstances, but we are solid because the things that are around us are changed because of who we are. And who we are is not changed but because of what is around us. So we thank that you are making us into love as women. The Lord God Almighty, you have honored this meeting with your presence and we will see the evidence of your fruit and your change in our lives. Bless yeah. every woman who is here today. And we thank you and we know that you are God Almighty have done a new thing in our hearts. So that thank you for a good week and the rest of the year ahead that you will be with us and testimonies and change will come out from this platform. Through your mighty name, Jesus Christ, we pray and thank you for answered prayer. Amen. Thank you very much, Mommy. Thank you. That's thank you. For making the announcement and then we will do um, our affirmation for the day. Oh, okay. um, so this event has been brought to you by Wives Gist. Um, who are we? Um, Wives Gist is a community of women with a passion for sharing practical wisdom nuggets, you know, to help wives and wives to be, to enjoy marriage and fulfill their purpose as intended by God. You can join us today, you can join our community on YouTube, uh, on Instagram. And if you want to connect with mommy, uh, mommy on Instagram is mommy con, mommy con, and uh, mommy con. Okay, mommy. I'm uh, sorry, I'm saying it like a Yoruba. <laughs> no problem. Mommy con. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I am Fukuola as a true north practice. And if you need to speak with someone, if you need to someone to share with someone to, um, kind of talk to whatever it is you're going through or experiencing in your life, um, your marriage, your relationship, please send us an email at wivesgist at gmail.com. Wivesgist at gmail.com. Okay, now to our affirmation. Okay, um, we are going to please say this after me. It says, I am physically, mentally, I am physically, and emotionally I am, ready. I am physically, physically mentally, and, and emotionally, emotionally ready, ready. ready to enter a new phase in my life. To, to enter, enter a new phase in a new phase in my life. I am ready to grow and get better. I, I am ready, ready to grow and get better. And get better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited. And I believe that we're all going to do better in our lives. This year, 2020, we mark a major turnaround in our lives. Amen. Uh, do enjoy the rest of um, the evening and have a great week ahead. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.